turn the time over to Andy and Alicia that are here from Backcountry, and I'll let them introduce themselves a little bit better. And
uh, is that we are a more premium retailer uh, in the outdoor space. Um, and we really exist to erase the boundary. So I talked about Backcountry Group is sort of what our mission is. Um, backcountry is a site. We exist to erase the boundaries between humans and nature. Uh, we really help people cut through the noise, be human, and pursue the community uh, internally. Internal. I'm not going to spend more time on that. It could go on for hours. We have a lot of company stuff on that, but we want to get to the product line for the life cycle management. Uh, competitive cyclist. The big picture here, we feel we have a passion for <coughs> cycling paired with the best technology. Competitive cyclist sells bikes that are anywhere from you know a thousand dollars to twenty thousand dollars. So very premium, uh, probably the most premium bike site you can go to um, online. Um, we champion the cyclist way of life as well. Um, some of the brands we carry there, uh, some of those premium in this uh, space, and then definitely for the roadie, the mountain biker, but um, all bikes and tire weights. And then competitive lands up, uh, landscape here is Amazon. Um, also Jensen, uh, if you guys are familiar with that one as well, Jensen USA. Local bike shops are the biggest competitor, actually. Uh, most people buy their bikes at a bike shop. So. Uh, and then direct consumer brands like Canyon, uh, Rock Girl, uh, and their own spaces. Perth uh, We are Europe's number one outdoor player based in Germany, just outside Stuttgart. Uh, it was founded in 2006, so there's 170 employees there. Um, Basically, it looks a lot like backcountry uh, if you go on their site. Um, and that's by, by purpose. Uh, like I mentioned, there's actually 13 sites throughout Europe just because of different rules like GDPR, uh, which is really boring, so we'll look that. Uh, but we also oper op operate Alpeniste in France and Alpine Trek in the UK. Uh, otherwise, if you go uh, to the EU and search for backcountry, it'll pop up as per friend. Right now, those are our six fo focus markets, the UK, France, Netherlands, Germany, uh, Austria, and Switzerland. And then Motorsport. Motorsport is based out of Portland. Uh, it was founded in 1999. We have 80 employees there, um, really to, uh, focusing on the power of sports enthusiasts. Uh, we exist so you never miss a ride. Um, really focus on bike parts uh, as well as riding the tires. And Steven Chief is operated here as well in Park City. Um, it's really capitalized on flash sites and one deal at a time, or ODAT, uh, if you guys are familiar with that. Uh, we had all these different sites here, Chain Love was here on the show, Bong Town, Gross Society, uh, Department of Goods, they have all been collapsed into Steam Engine at this point. And really this is the merger, uh, we have emerged the leader for, out, uh, for discount gear. Uh, off price, we buy a lot. So if you think about like Patagonia makes too much of something um, or can't sell something, we're probably going to be their first choice to purchase it. Uh, we just had a lot of experience with that. Um, working with like off price, um, but our competitors there are the Climb, REI Outlet, and you know, Oops, it's not All right, for backcountry, we're a backcountry group. Um, can someone name one of the top five songs? How do you go <laughs> Anybody else? I'll give, I'll give two. Yeah, I know. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. Yep. There's two. There were two for that one. So <coughs> top five selling brands: Arcteryx, Marmot, Patagonia, Shimano, and the space. Shimano, largely from competitive cyclists. So a lot of Shimano. All right. Three of our six office locations. You have to name three. Yeah. Salt Lake. <laughs> so That's one. Denver? No. You're close. Boulder doesn't count. It's a contractor. <laughs> yeah. uh, West Valley Park City and Portland. Yes. Uh, there's also Christiansburg, which is where the Virginia Fulfillment Center is. Uh, we have an office in Costa Rica where most of our engineering is done, uh, product engineering. And then uh, in Germany. The West Valley City is uh, both the fulfillment center as well as our gearheads and uh, customer service operations. But we're based in Park City. Um, you guys know Park City, Salt Lake, Christiansburg, Portland, Missouri, Germany. I'm not going to focus on that too much. <laughs> All right. Three. Oh, man. I already gave this one, so I'm not going to do that. <laughs> All right. Let's talk about product line management. That's why we're here today. Um, so this is the fantasy. Um, I took on this job. Uh, three years ago, 
I actually came from the world of uh, private equity and consulting before I went to business school, after business school. Uh, came out, was running a fragrance company. Um, then I went to Nordstrom, um, worked in men's apparel and e-commerce in Nordstrom. Uh, then I went to VF and worked on the Sportswear Coalition, um, which is more less outdoor, more their sportswear brands like Nautica, Napa Theory, um, and an uh, out uh, backpack bag brand called uh, Kipling. Um, so I had some notions of what I thought uh, getting into you know, our brands privately will be. Um, it's not perfect and it's not um, all just working with clothes and working with uh, designers. The reality um, is slightly different. You're creating cats, um, you're telling the future a little bit, uh, or trying to tell the future. You're sitting in front of a computer a lot, in front of spreadsheets. Um, you're time traveling. Uh, like I said, Alicia and the IRR, you think about 2021 or 2022 in some cases. Um, you do get to play with Pantones a lot, so that's cool. Um, but it's a big job. It's, like I said, time traveler, fortune teller, data scientist. Uh, you're being a diplomat, especially in backcountry. Uh, all at the same time, you're just always working at least three seasons. So we have fall, winter, 19 delivering right now. Um, so we're trying to make sure things go up on site, that things come into your QC, and they're, they're correct as they were in the factory, as they did off the boat here, uh, and getting into our warehouse. Um, we're worrying about what spring buys are going to be and making sure those POs are placed uh, and that they're still tracking from a work in progress standpoint. Um, we're worrying about what we're designing into for fall 20 or finishing design prototypes in fall 20, making those buys, talking to the CFO about you know, how much cash is going out the door, when um, Alicia's analyzing sales performance, pricing, promotions, and doing color. She's like, Alicia and I spent hours on the floor of our CEO's office working through Pantones the less sexy part of our job sometimes. Um, and then working across every one of the organization really. Um, so whether that's our design team, tech design, sourcing, marketing, finance, accounting, et cetera, et cetera. Um, there's a lot of work to be done because once you're starting a, a line from concept, you have to get it all the way to the end and uh, make sure it gets into the customer's hands. And a large part of that for us is the gearheads who are interacting with our customers to make sure they're educated about it. So a lot of what we think about right now for 2019 is Make sure your heads see the product and make sure they understand what it's all about, how they can sell it to the customers. So I'm going to let Alicia walk you through sort of what our go-to-market process is, because she's really uh, in charge when it. So Alicia works on the backcountry brand specifically, um, and that's you know our biggest brand in-house uh, for us. It's most important because it is you know our namesake brand, um, and it's a huge process. So while she's interacting with all those other people, she's still in charge of pushing through the entire process and making sure that um, we go from, you know, what is a concept for one season actually turns into real products um, and gets delivered. Yeah. Um, yeah, so the beginning of seasonal kickoff, I'm pretty much starting 2021 right now, um, both seasons, spring, summer, and fall, winter. Um, typically, it should just be one, but we're trying to get in front of the calendar. As a new brand, I would say, um, production calendar is the biggest hurdle that you have to overcome just based on timing of everything. Um, but yeah, so kicking off this seasonal um, strategy, we really have these, these three that are highlighted in red is really, um, it's an important function to have a lot of cross-functional alignment on. Um, so for Spring Summer 21, I'm currently working on uh, the product line briefing, um, which is kind of further down as we go here, but prior to that, we want to gain all of this kind of concept input and cross-functional alignment. So um, the brand and design concept is really going to come from our design team and then our brand marketing team and also our executives, really trying to understand what we're trying to project um, or um, present as a brand each season um, from a strategic design standpoint or a brand play that we want to make that year. Um, product line and category strategy. This is really going to be how we develop the brand. So BG&A, Fashion Tree Gear and Apparel, um, is so new that we're starting to push into new categories. So right now we have apparel. Um, in spring, summer, we have mountain bike um, soft goods and we have Klein soft goods, but we've also collaborated with a lot of our brand partners to do some hard goods collabs. So for spring, summer, 19, we had a collab with Metolius where we did a crash pad. Um, we collaborated with So Ill on a hangboard. Uh, and we also partnered with BD on a crag pad and a rain cover rope bag. Um, also with Edelweiss on a climbing rope. So 
we've tried to kind of differentiate. And the reason we'll collaborate with certain brands is uh, right now in our early stages is because to be transparent, we might not necessarily have the manufacturing base for some of those categories, but all of our brand partners um, will have those connection, and it also creates just like more stoke in the industry to have a really cool brand collaboration on certain products. So um, when we talk about the product line and category expansion, we'll have a lot of those conversations that, you know, if we want to move into here and manufacture that ourselves, we have to really be ahead of that so our sourcing team can go out and find the, the factories that will do it for us. And because the brand is relatively young, as we just said, you know, we actually had the luxury of setting out and saying, what do we want this brand to stand for? What do we know the backcountry brand should probably stand for? What are the categories we sell most of? Um, what we settled on was mountain bike, climb, uh, snow sports, which is you know, the loose coverage for like ski and snowboard, um, and then uh, hike and camp. Um, so obviously we know what we sell, obviously, and we can say these are the biggest categories we want to play in, but also from a backcountry you know, way of life and who our uh, internal uh, employee is, what our gearhead does, we want to make sure we focus on that. So uh, as we set out strategy for the overall brand, um, it was really aligning on those as our big core pursuits um, and then filling in what products uh, meant for those pursuits. We also have the luxury of data. We've been around since 96, as someone said. And um, as a retailer, we have a lot of category information and brand information around what sells especially with me coming from the merchandising area, it's really helpful to have that insight so we can really build on the most uh, lucrative categories for the brand. Um, so after we talk about what our product line um, strategy will be, we talk about the first. Um, so the financial planning aspect, we usually have a three YP or a three year plan uh, where we look out um, for future years as a company and then disseminate budgets by category and own brands is um, now operating under their own budget. So we'll effectively be creating growth targets for sales volume, our margin targets, and turn targets um, as it pertains to inventory flow. So um, all of that is kind of discussed so we can know how much product we need to build to put to those plans. Um, Comp shop and inspiration sampling. This is probably like the fantasy slide that um, Andy showed. Um, this is where you can get really creative as a design partner or a product line manager or merchant. Um, it's when you can kind of go out into the market and see see what's going on. I think for an outdoor working for an outdoor retailer is really fun because it can do things, um, the activities that we sell products for, like mountain bike, and skiing. Um, you just kind of you can go out and see what people are wearing to different resorts. Um, that's kind of like a lower budget way of doing it, just being very in tune of what people are wearing. And then there's a fun part that you build into your travel budget and going to certain places. Um, for 2022, as we concept next year, we're looking at going to Oslo and Stockholm to kind of look at it more of an outdoor European city, uh, cities. And then um, for summer, we just, spring summer, we went to New York, we talked about London, um, and I think going to like Portland or Vancouver would be great because they have more of that outdoor consumer. So you really go, you can buy, um, I would say, inspiration samples or aspiration samples. Things that like you're inspired by, um, you can kind of um, do certain takedowns that pertain to your brand or be inspired, inspired by the silhouette of a product or the function of a gear and um, bring it to your design team and see how you can concept, concept something similar. And aspirational would be, you know, if you're looking at more high-end designers that are pretty out of reach, but things that will trickle down. So if you're looking at, like, you know, for us, like Vince and Gucci and things like that, <coughs> kind of more contemporary, but everything trickles down to outdoor eventually or into mass market, you can look at that as a future thinking um, for certain product development. So that used to be, sorry to interrupt, no, that okay. used to be much more of like a four-year sort of trickle down um, as outdoor thought about it. Um, that gets shorter and shorter every year now. It seems like maybe it's a year and a half to two years max of mm -hmm. a trickle down, sort of like, and from a trend perspective. So whether it's like, you know, skinny jeans or um, pleated pants, um, that happens faster um, to get to the outdoor. Where outdoor, you know, if you look at Prana pants like four years ago, mm -hmm. you know, straight leg or even boot, um, boot cut was just like all you could buy. Um, now, you know, every brand is offering multiple kind of fits. So, you're starting to see that really um, respond faster. Um, so we have to respond faster. Yeah. 
And I think with younger generations like yourselves pushing into the outdoor space has been really <coughs> helpful for the industry because it's making us push um, our relevancy and progression from a product standpoint because we used to be like pretty dated. Um, and also social media, obviously, trends are just pulsed um, so quickly that influencers on so, uh, Instagram and other platforms that they're getting picked up so much faster. So we're, have, we're getting more of a challenge there, but we are a little bit slower, I would say, than the regular fashion or contemporary space. So that's the fun part, and we can bring those back basically when we have our comp shop samples, we bring them back to design during concept review, which I'll go into in a little bit. Um, so as a retailer, we also do have the luxury of having a merchandising team um, that has a lot of inputs in the industry, hence like the department I transitioned from, um, my old team, will basically be pre-lining with some of our top brands like the North Face and Patagonia and seeing what their color concepts are, um, what new um, feature sets are going to be new for outerwear or what fabric technologies are coming into the space that we can really learn from. So. I'll sit down with the merchandising leads and talk about inputs by season for spring, summer, or fall, winter. Um, and they're a little bit behind us because we work so much further ahead, but at least we can get a glimpse of what everyone else in the industry is doing um, and get that input from the team. Um, GHO, so this is our gearhead operations team. Uh, they're based in Salt Lake, um, out in West Valley. Someone can hear the answer for West Valley. Um, they had so much knowledge as it pertains to consumer input. Um, customers are calling them and asking for things. They know they have a book of business that they manage, or they have really, um, I would say, backcountry cheerleader clientele that come back to the site regularly to purchase. So they know um, exactly what our customers want. And they're also, um, to be fair, they have more flexible hours than we do up in Park City. Um, and via inbound or outbound customer service, they'll be able to um, really use the gear we sell. Um, while we do that up in Park City, I think they just have a little bit more freedom and luxury to do it with brands coming down there and clinicking, taking them on events and so forth. So from like a functionality standpoint, they'll have a lot of product feedback for us. So um, we'll sit down with them and get inputs every season around categories and products and what they want to see. And also getting down to feature sets like beacon clips and pockets or waist adjustability on mountain bike pants or you know, all of these features that are super important to them and they may not be finding with competitors' products, so we can get all of that input from that team, which is super helpful for us. So once we get those inputs, we'll also get inputs from um, trend agencies that we work with, which is specifically Doniger, if anyone's familiar with that. Um, they're a trend forecasting service that um, quite a few retailers use. So you can, um, we'll sit down with them and they'll do a trend presentations on color, um, fabrics, trims, um, just general like social trends, um, everything that kind of goes into building a season. And some of it can be relative to outdoor, but a lot of it is more contemporary. But like I said, everything trickles down. So I think <coughs> the general awareness of that broader landscape is super important. Sorry, does that mean I'm talking too much? No, no. <laughs> um, so we'll get those inputs as well. So that means we get merchandising input, gearhead input, and then a greater trend input from Doniger. Um, and then we talk about brand collabs, like the really fun stuff with other brands, kind of like I talked about for spring. Um, we have some exciting stuff coming up for 2020, but as we think about different categories to branch into, we'll start those conversations with brands. Sometimes um, it can be, um, an interesting conversation to navigate because some brands essentially think, you know, we're taking all the information we have and building our own product and we don't want to buy their stuff anymore. But I think Backcountry as a brand has this differentiator amongst the industry where like REI is not collabing with brands. Um, uh, MEC up in Vancouver isn't collabing with brands. They're just building a value oriented kind of label where we can basically pursue these collaborations with brands, increase their receipts for a season, and have this really exciting marketing story to tell while still helping them out. Um, so I think it's a key differentiator for us right now. So it's a really um, key component for us in more of our pursued products or pinnacle products that we try to create. And we definitely build them more at like a premium price point than um, a value price point. Uh, and then I start the briefs. <laughs> so that's like a lot of inputs um, because as much as I'd like to think I know everything to build for the season, I like to um, make sure I get all inputs <coughs> before we start briefing in the categories.
categories and products I'll be going after. Um, so I'll start the product briefs um, for right now, spring, summer 21 and fall, winter 2021. And there, what I do is really set up the framework for design, sourcing, and tech, tech design um, to really understand everything there is about a product. Like, what's the product objective? Um, what's the consumer objective? What's the price point position? What are the silhouette and features? Um, what's the fabric inspiration I'm thinking about? Um, our target cost, our target landed cost, because the retail that it's going to be in. Like basically, once I have, once I have that going, design will always come to the table with um, <coughs> fabrics that are probably unachievable from a price point standpoint. So then our sourcing team will take it and like cost manufacture and source that um, to a more affordable fabric. So I want to make sure I set up that brief very detailed, so everyone has a very clear direction of what we're developing for the season. Sustainability is also a portion. Oh yeah, sustainability is something we're starting to push more in fall, winter of 20, and it's becoming obviously a very relevant play in the retail landscape. Um, so sustainability can mean anything from recycled, and I know there's a lot of post-consumer or different avenues of recycled. Um, we're also looking at blue science certifications, um, responsibly sourced down, um, natural dyes, things that we can do to really impact our production line. Um, more responsibly. So that'll be a component too. So then my fabric gal will know, okay, I need to only look at blue sign fabrics or I need to look at um, mills and factories that only have the blue sign process in place. So it's, it's super helpful for them. Questions about the season? Any questions <coughs> pop up, don't feel like you can't ask to be Yeah. Right. Yeah. Does that sound oh, yeah. like something you guys want to do? Um. <laughs> You guys have like positive results when you guys like do two years in advance, like plan two years in advance. Like positive yeah. results from like a, a revenue perspective. Yeah, compared to like other com like other companies. You know how you're saying that you're above like ahead of them. Mm -hmm. So we're ahead of the buying team, which is buying more. So like the buying team in November uh, will be going out to buy fall winter twenty. Um, so they're kind of like a year ahead, where we're working two years ahead, but like Patagonia, for instance, is still on that two-year calendar um, from a development standpoint, but our buying team, because like they just buy what has been produced, they're not involved in like producing the line, so our buying team is on a shorter like cycle, but every other brand is essentially on a two-year calendar or longer in some cases. Okay. Yeah, so we're all kind of trying to tell the future. Okay. Yeah. We have a calendar up in our office that shows sort of like four, five different seasons and where we're at in those. Um, brands like Arcteryx are like three years out in developing like their highest end lines because they're sourcing new fabrics from whoever the fabric partners, whether it's Pertex Torre, Cortex, uh, et cetera, uh, North Face with their future light fabric. That was you know, six years of development time just for the fabric. So then, you know, designing that line out and the quantities they're producing, they're producing, they're, they're setting the factories up, you know, two years in advance, or at least putting in their factory commitments two years in advance, whereas I get nailed because we have two years time and the, my CEO wants us to move faster, 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 which in outdoor is very tough. Uh, fast fashion can move really fast because, you know, they can they have those turnarounds and you're using basic fabrics or you're sourcing fabrics ahead of time and you're storing it. Uh, but when you're looking at, you know, a $32 a yard Cortex membrane, um, you're not going to want to hold that because they also don't want you to hold it more than six months. Um, so there's a lot of different things coming to play for like our most technical product. So our most technical product is like a two-year lead time. Um, some of our basics though for basic range do go on a six-month or lower or shorter uh, lead. So we'll do we'll source things in like a factory in LA, uh, which are does pretty basic cottons, um, you know, organic cottons. So we can actually do that design, you know, from design concept to production a much shorter time frame. So we have different pods in our um, process for tech design. And so like we have the vector pod, which is like the two year plus, that's like the super high end technical stuff. And we have like pod A, B, C, C is the shortest lead time for us. So that's like a simple logo wear t-shirt or uh, logo wear design, like factory logo, um, to basic teens, um, and simple silhouettes that are in simple fabrics or easy to source fabrics. 
Yeah, so I'll continue. If there's any questions, just raise your hand. Um, so after the seasonal kickoff, we go into those briefs. That kind of like gives the team all the tools they need to start um, developing and designing. Um, so <clears throat> as we go into the design portion of the calendar, we'll look at color. And a lot of the color inputs for merchandising and then the trend services really help guide this. And then just general selling trends that um, I'm seeing, or I'm from the competitive space, what I'm seeing kind of come down from the runways is like an important color. Um, we'll make sure that's incorporated into the palette so we have everything that we need for the season. Um, and then we go into design review one, which I would say is really a working session. This is when design comes to the table um, with an assortment based on the briefs. And we'll usually design other options outside of the brief just so we can narrow it down. So it's very much a working session um, between all kind of cross-functional members on the team. Um, <clears throat> and we'll also get GHO inputs here in between the design reviews um, to get really particular with the tech packs and the feature sets of the product so we can be really dialed as we go into tech pack handoff. Um, and uh, design... Question. So oh, is, sorry. You call, is GHO basically like a product testing sector of your company? Yeah, so that, sorry, that's GearHead operations. Right. So we have <coughs> within the GearHeads, there's about 300 200, yeah, seasonal seasonal picks up. So like right now we're hiring, we'll have like 600 gearheads for Q4. Um, but anyway, within that group of gearheads, we have ambassadors um, for each sport or pursuit. So we'll have about you know 10 to 15 gearheads that are focused on skiing, uh, backwards skiing. 10 to 15 gearheads focused on climbing, um, and they we pull them together for roundtables based on that pursuit product. We have, we have a lifestyle group as well, which is focused on like lifestyle apparel. Um, so we pull them into a group. Uh, we walk them through the CADs um, with our design team. Um, we show them all the colors and we get their feedback. Yeah. So again, they're super valuable resource that is a differentiator for us that, you know, REI doesn't have, um, Bass Pro doesn't have, Walmart doesn't have. Um, our gearheads have this one-to-one -one connection with the customers that is super critical for us. Yeah, there is, they are essentially our customer service team, but we've um, figured out a really great way to utilize them in a larger capacity. Um, and I love our CEO always says, like, um, we're personalizing the internet with GearHeads because it's a very much like a concierge service on the site. <coughs> so they just have a lot of customer insights that really help us from a product standpoint. Um, so we'll get their inputs in between um, DR1 or Design Review 1 and DR2. And DR2, um, that's when we get more executives and cross-functional partners involved to really, really get buy-in on the designs that we're moving forward with for that season. And then color review post design review two is where we attach all of that color to certain garments and features. Um, so in the beginning, it's really just initial color, and we aren't tying that to any product. Um, but that after DR two, like we're aligned on the styles, and we tie in color um, for each key item. So after design, um, this is when we the go to market alignment is really um, since everyone's in the DR two meeting. We really want to gain alignment on our um, brand storytelling um, or our marketing concepts for the season. Um, and then our forecast alignment, have we built a line that can put to the plans that we've essentially built. Um, so GTM, our go-to-market alignment, is really cross-functional alignment of what we're doing each season. <coughs> um, so that'll come after we kind of have more of our concepts to show. Yeah. And marketing has been involved in that seasonal kickoff and everything from like, okay, what is the story we're telling about now <coughs> like this season? Is it a new fabric? Is it, you know, is it a destination story? Is it, you know, tra travel was our big story for this fall. Um, and, you know, traveling and getting your destination because we were launching our luggage products right now. Um, so they're involved in that. And then once they've seen the product, they're like, okay, here's the truth, the real story. This bag is like you know, your bomber bag. And this is what you know, what story we're actually telling when it gets down to the product level. So it sort of trickles down. It goes high concept or detail if we go for the level. Yeah, and then this is when my job kind of ends, <laughs> but not really. Um, tech pack handoff and first proto development. This is like, once we've been the alignment on the line for the season, this is when design will um, give our sourcing team all of the initial tech packs, and we'll work through all the details from trim, trim sets, feature sets, logoing, branding, everything like that. Um, and so those will be packaged up with a nice bow. We send them to the factories that we want to source them to, and then the development um, essentially kicks off. First proto will come in about four to six weeks, yeah, four to six weeks after tech pack handoff. Um, and we like to do two protos, third if it's like the product's a disaster at proto. Proto development is like, you know, your initial samples in the factory. 
So first credo, usually a little rough. <laughs> if it's like very good, that means second proto is going to be a breeze and you can essentially move into finalizing production. Um, so we'll go to third proto if it's still a little bit of a disaster at second proto and we need to see another one before we cut bulk production. Um, so we go through this whole process. Um, color and lab dips will start after tech pack handoff. Um, so basically we've picked color via CADs and line art, but now we want to see the actual fabric dipped in that um, color. Yeah. Have you ever had to go through all of this process and then you get to the protos and you just figure out that it's not working at all and you yes. just have to cut the whole thing? Yeah, that happens a lot. Um, if you can cut if you can cut the style before you cut your grays, which is your bulk fabric, or before it's dyed, maybe you have grays but you can put it into another style. Um, or if it's dyed, you take the liability and potentially put it into another silhouette for a future season if the mill or factory is willing to bolt the product or the fabric. Um, that could be the only issue. Um, but yes, as a PLM or merchant, you'll deal with fabric liabilities quite often. Um, either if you cut a style below the fabric minimums and you have excess that you need to use, or you cut bait and switch because you're like, that style is not going to sell. <laughs> you have to put it into something else. Um, so yeah, that's very, very much a real thing. And it's really unfortunate because you see how much work goes into it. Um, but if it's something you believe in, like there's a travel jacket for spring 20 that I love. It's going to be kind of like a more casual synthetic insulated piece, kind of like the mountain sweatshirt from the North Face, if anyone's seen it. Um, just like a little bit more of a friendly price point. We use a lot of different um, fabrics to try and create it, it just didn't execute well. But I was like, let's keep protoing this. We'll just move it to a fall transition order versus spring and try to make, make this work because I really believe in the product. So you can always push out your um, delivery time as long as there's not a huge financial implication to missing your plan. But um, yeah, there's a lot of um, movement that will happen if you, if you don't want to produce a product. Um, when you change, like, after, like, a photo review and, like, you have to change something, do you have to go back into, like, the previous process and, like, do, like, design reviews, or do you just kind of, like, change as you go? We just change as we go. As a product line manager, um, I have the autonomy from Andy to do what's best for the product, and we'll loop him in on any, like, two very big decisions that we're making to change a product, but no, you don't have to go through that whole process, because essentially you gain that alignment with cross-functional partners on the direction of the product. So if it's a slight zipper adjustment or pocket change, um, or slight change to the product, you should be good to go. Cool. Yeah. Um, so the color and lab dips, like I said, is actually dipping the fabric in that product um, in those colors you want, because a Gore-Tex dip is going to render completely different than like a jersey knit in like, you know, a bluestone blue. So you want to really see that and we even though we'll build out the assortment with certain colors we'll also have additional dips like two to three because I'm like okay I think I want black gray navy in this parka but I also want to see this like forest green and asphalt just to make sure because then you can see all the colors and I can change the color assortment if one color is rendering better on the fabric than another so um, that's that part that we kind of work on as the um, factories are developing photos. And we'll go into first and second. This is when we do fits. So you'll have all your fit comments via fit models that come in. Hey, you right now. Um, but we do have fit models that come in that measure to a certain spec that we want to fit for the BGA customer. And um, that's when we'll make the fit tweaks. Our sourcing, our tech design team in charge of fits will mark the garment if there's like a seam change that we need to make or pin it if it's not fitting right at the front yoke or anything like that. We'll make all of those adjustments through first and second proto. We usually throw it on other people in the office too just to see other body types wearing the product. It's, it's great to have your, your fit model that's like you know, your ideal fit, but um, they're only in you know, a day you know, every couple of weeks or so when we're doing these protos. So it's nice to say, hey, the person from merchandising or from finance, throw this on real quick. It's sometimes awkward for them, but it's super helpful. Yeah. Um, about 10 minutes left, so I'm going to kind of rush a yeah. little bit and make sure you guys have time for questions. Um, ordering wear tests is something um, like why we're moving the calendar forward so much. Um, we haven't had a chance to do this, and 
Um, we have war tests, some of our product, like our Vortex coming this year, but we really want to build in more tests for everything, especially building so much of this like end use oriented product. Um, so um, after you go through second proto and you're like, okay, it's pretty dialed, let's order wear tests and size sets and we'll get it out to people to wear and see how it functions before we actually cut the buy. Um, so this is, then we'll approve lab gifts from everything that we have coming in. And our sourcing gal is great. She kind of <laughs> sits in her color room in the dark and all these different lights to approve lab gifts to make sure they look good in every single light possible. Um, and we'll order SMS or salesman samples and merge samples. So this is essentially for marketing, for merchandising, for content, for photo studio. We'll order everything so everyone has their own set. Third quarter review is needed. And then confirming capacity and costing. This is just with factories. Like, are we hitting mints? What are the cost estimates we're getting so we know we're hitting our markups, markups, et cetera? Um, and then we have a buy review where we loop in our uh, executive team um, and talk about you know the, the financial obligation we're making um, for BGNA, uh, ensuring that it's hitting our plan, or if it's not, um, how we're you know mitigating any risk. And then SKU creation and PO uh, processing. Uh, so we'll send all the POs for, to the factories and create our style names, our color names, all that stuff. Um, kind of the very tactical level of order writing. It's a lot of manual data entry at that point. Yeah. Like process and process. Yeah. Yeah, and then I won't dive into this a ton because it's outside of the product line management um, development cycle. But essentially, um, the marketing portion will just make sure that we kind of wrap up um, what they need for content samples, do we have our campaigns ready, um, seasonal brand book is like an internal catalog we use, um, and then ensuring that we, they have all the samples they needed, like I said, and um, for their lo location shoot, wherever they're going. Um, and then launch, our sourcing team does some QC um, at the factories in Asia, and they also do some in our DC here, our distribution center in Salt Lake. Um, we'll shoot all of our um, images for the site. Um, We'll do some product seeding with influencers or some of our brand ambassadors just to kind of get some hype out there on social. Um, we approve the PDP imagery just to ensure it's up to our standards. PDP, PDP products by page. Yeah, just basically the page you see a product and buy it from. Um, and yeah, product will arrive in the DC. It takes about a week to go live on our site. And then, um, yeah, go live and we retrospect the season. Um, I just retrospected spring what year are we in? 19. Um, last month, because it was the end of the season. Uh, so just kind of like high level view, this is the revenue we gained, these were top sellers, high performing styles, all that stuff, so we can take those insights to future seasons. Um, that's really how we like the season insight. And although Alicia said her job tends to end short of the production phase and like doesn't, isn't involved so much in the marketing of launch um, until retrospective, um, she is so responsible, so in my eyes, you know, my PLMs are responsible for making sure that everybody else is doing their job. Um, so she has, you know, her own direct reports, but she also has these dotted line reports. So whether it's her counterpart in marketing to make sure things um, are getting campaigns written up for them, or like the product copy is correct in the email that goes out to sell a certain product, um, or that the content team in the studio is actually making sure that the, the photo samples are shot on time, and their service level agreement with us is, you know, still being met. Yeah. So she has like a zillion things uh, to do. Still very much involved. I meant like more of the product development aspect for that season is done. And like when I was retrospecting spring 19, we were prioritizing fall 19. I was wrapping up spring summer 20, also working on 2021 briefs for spring summer and fall winter. So there's like a lot of seasons you live in at once, which is why we have a big laminated calendar that we like to use. <laughs> Uh, what's like your favorite part of the job? My favorite part of the job is essentially when the product goes live and it performs well. Because <laughs> you spend so much time developing something you believe in and when that like comes to fruition, it's really rewarding. That's actually why I joined Andy's team because before buying other people, other people's product they developed, sure if I invested in it right, it was great, it was very much a numbers game but to intimately like be involved with the development of a product and then see it crush, it's like very rewarding. <laughs> um, once you do that, so I found that was in chief, and how did you go about starting that? 
Yeah, I don't know when we found the platform, but essentially most retailers need an exhaust channel or an outlet. Like you see the outlets in Park City, around here, all these stores kind of have um, this exhaust channel for either aged product or product they're developing specifically for outlets. So it was it was formed to really um, sell our aged product, but also sell a lot of the closeout product we get, which is past season, but we get it heavily discounted, so we can make it's very margin accretive. So we'll create a site where it can just be catered to more of that um, price conscious consumer, and we could keep backcountry more premium and full price for like new season type stuff. But I don't have a year. The one deal at a time are ODAT sites were pretty big, like right around 2000. Yeah, it's like when Groupon is big, so everyone like to look young for that. Probably from the day. You're aging yourself. Okay, yikes, sorry. Okay. How do you decide which factories? Uh, good question. Um, what for us, um, that they have low mins is the first. Um, we are, I mean, if you look at like a brand like North Face, they're making thousands to tens of thousands of units in a single style. We're still in the hundreds. Um, a few of our styles, we are lucky enough that like they crush in or thousands at a time. Um, but we're really, uh, we, we have to find the factories that will take a lot more time for us. Um, so that's like our first. And then the, the next is, um, there's a myriad of things that go into consideration. So tariffs, so we've actually moved a lot out of China. Say we probably had 60% exposure to China through now, um, and that'll go, we're slicing that over half um, next year when we go to some other countries. Um, we take into account um, the, you know, the country of origin, obviously from a tariff perspective, um, the quality of their product. Um, so we're looking at factories that all of these players, um, outdoor and for the most part, um, none of them we're not the only, we don't own any factories directly, so we're we make sure we get line access. Um, and then they do really good work um, because part of the back end branch simply is like make sure that it's like a good to premium quality. Um, can't be shoddy, especially when you're considering like, the Cortex jacket, it just has to be really well done, seen, sealed, well done, that sort of thing. Um, so they have to have that functionality. Um, then they give us good terms and we have full transparency. So one of the uh, issues we had before I came on was that we didn't have full transparency in the costing. Um, we were sort of like trusting the factories to give us really good costing. Um, we expect them now to like detail every little single piece up, which is normal for most brands, but we, when we were smaller, we just didn't have that sort of insight. Um, and then from a sustainability factor, so like we're trying to push much more sustainable footprint um, as we grow, and that's really important for us. So it's the factories aren't aligned with that. Um, and so also looking to be like closer <laughs> to the U.S. Um, we've evaluated factories in the U.S., we've evaluated factories in Mexico, or Central America. Um, there's a, a struggle with like one, you can get lower, lower uh, minimums. Um, we actually will bring a factory online in Portugal next for our spring uh, si spring season, um, which is great because they do low minimums and it's like closer. It's also super close for our European uh, counterparts, so we're going to we'll get most of their product from that factory. Um, but it's a, it's, it's a consideration that goes in every whether the factory does this really well, whether it does Gore-Tex really well, um, pants, you can go by category, um, or pattern, and do some things. Um, I have another question. So yeah. for finding them, um, is it mostly just like networking? Uh, yeah, I'd say like 75% of it is networking, and maybe 25% is sort of, um, you hear about it, um, and you reach out, um, or they reach out, like every once in a while, you come know, from a factory that's like, hey, we're here, we do these things. Uh, one of our camp, um, as we were launching camp next year, um, is they actually reached out to us and said, oh, let's see if they do a little bit of a range of things that we've seen this one. Um, so, yeah, mostly networking, though. Yeah. We got time for just this last one right here. And then. Okay. You have a one engineering team in Puerto Rico. Oh, it's, um, so we were one of the, we were the number one employer in Puerto Rico by the like, rating, apparently. Um, uh, we, our founder, Jim Holland, um, big surfer, and went down to Costa Rica a lot, and found that there was, like, these very highly educated people down there from an uh, engineering um, software coding perspective, because we were entirely online. Um, he thought, why don't we build an engineering office down here so I can travel more? 
<laughs> goes through, you know. But also there's great talent, and so you know, that builds quite a bit of our um, One last question. Um, what's one of the brands we call, we're collaborating with, or we collaborated with this past spring? Edelweiss? No. Yeah. Who said Edelweiss? Yeah. You get a hall. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, everybody. <laughs> Thanks, so we'll hang around for questions. Yeah. All right, let's give him a hand.